All right, welcome to all our viewers. My name is Alex and I'll be hosting today's discussion on regulations that came in power at the beginning of this year in Europe and uh, more specifically the anti-money laundering directive from January 2020. Here with me are experts in the field of blockchain and crypto regulations and I'm going to introduce them shortly after which they're going to have their own pieces and give more insights into what is going on with regulations and who is affected by them in Europe. First, we have Ivar Zukowskis, who is the CCO of Bitflyer Europe. And uh, he's going to give a bit of history about the company, how it navigated the changing landscape of regulations in Europe and what the future holds for uh, exchanges and regulations related to them. Then we have Raido Saar, who is the Compliance Officer and Co-CEO of PXPay. And uh, he's going to give a variety of attitudes towards crypto in EU countries, the challenges that are unique to fiat, to crypto providers, and the regulations for this kind of services. Uh, we have also here with us Robert Steinadler, who is the Editor-in-Chief at the Bitcoin Courier. And he's going to talk about the crypto news industry comment about the willingness of regulators and other officials to interact with crypto sites, as well as the censorship on content creators and that they face. And also here uh, we have with us Nikolai Temchuk, who is a crypto lawyer uh, and a lawyer in general, but also a fintech specialist. And uh, here he'll talk more about the conflicts between laws and the crypto industry and specifically provide uh, more information about speculation of laws uh, that uh, might be implemented in the future and why. So today, this event is hosted by CryptoMood. Uh, it's the fundamental analysis tools provider for superior trading decisions. I would like to welcome our viewers to tweet uh, basically uh, with at CryptoMood and using the hashtags Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for the chance to win $100. The best question wins the $100 in cryptocurrency of their choice. We suggest Bitcoin. So tweet your questions using the ad crypto mood with hashtag Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. All right, let's get down to business. Uh, so we're going to start with Ivar Zukowskis, and he's going to talk more about Bitflyer Europe, its history, and he has a very nice presentation ready for us. So I'm hoping everyone participates with questions so that, that at the end we have a nice discussion as well. Go ahead, Ivor. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the kind introduction. And I'm happy and delighted to have the opportunity to speak today in front of all of you and share some of my experience with Bitflyer. So give me a second. I'll try to launch my presentation so that everyone can see it. One second. There we go. All right. So um, I will talk about Bitflyer. Bitflyer is actually a group of entities. Uh, we have our headquarters in Tokyo. We have an office in San Francisco and one office in Luxembourg, where I'm personally based. Um, Bitflyer Japan is registered as a virtual currency exchange operator. Bitflyer US is licensed in 46 states, including the New York's Bit license. And Bitfly Europe uh, is also a regulated payment institution in Luxembourg under the supervision of CSSF. So we are currently um, the only exchange that is uh, actually regulated and licensed on three continents worldwide. Um, and recently in Luxembourg, apart from uh, having a kind of a more traditional license as a payment institution, uh, there was a, a kind of a crypto specific registration framework introduced, such as the VASP registration framework. Um, obviously, uh, this is not nothing new for, for us as a regulated entity because we've been licensed since 2018. Um, so the VASP framework for us is more kind of a formality, which we obviously applied for uh, because this is uh, a regulatory need and obligation. But just to give you a kind of a comparison between what it means to be a regulated entity and an entity subject to the VASP 
registration. So this is a snapshot from our regulator's website. And here's the list of applicable legislation for VASPs in Luxembourg. So you can see that there's just one, um, one uh, regulatory text, which is the amended money laundering directive, which introduced a few definitions related to virtual currencies, virtual assets, and virtual asset service providers, and also called for the need to register with the CSSF. And here's in comparison, um, a list of legislations uh, applicable to payment institutions. As you can see, there's way more regulatory tax, all sorts of circulars, laws, regulations, uh, guidances, FAQs, etc. cetera. Um, and it's definitely way more than just being subject uh, to money laundering obligations. Uh, so yeah, being compliant is, is definitely not easy, uh, especially when you add um, to the kind of traditional regulation, a mix of cryptocurrencies, it all makes things more different and more difficult. Um, so I'll try to give some tips and maybe break down a few things uh, related to regulation today. So when we talk about the Fifth Money Laundry Directive, I think that was kind of a game changer for the industry in Europe. Um, I know a lot of entities were actually looking forward to some form of regulation or some form of clarity from their uh, home regulators. So now we have a framework set up in Europe. Um, so just a brief compared, like just a brief table summary of what was more kind of on a voluntary or non-mandatory basis before and what actually changed with the introduction of the fixed money laundering directive. As you can see, things like risk assessment, customer due diligence, uh, record keeping, enhanced due diligence, ongoing due diligence, anti manual policies and trainings, um, in internal and external audits, transaction monitoring tools uh, became mandatory. Specifically, I'd like to highlight also the uh, suspicious activity reporting, uh, which was not possible before uh, without the directive in place because Normally, entities that are not supervised or regulated cannot report to the FIU. So now this has become an opportunity and an obligation at the same time. Um, similarly, at the same time, record keeping, there were no specific requirements before then. Now, at least it has to be for five years. Uh, companies need to maintain re records of their customers, of their transactions and their activity. Uh, five years is the minimum, so it can vary from member state to member state. And lastly, Transaction monitoring, while not explicitly advocating for blockchain analytics tools, uh, it does say in the law that you, companies need to have adequate transaction monitoring. And if you're a company, uh, if you're a blockchain company, adequate moves most likely mean having some tools like elliptic chain analysis or score chain or whatever. Uh, there's a handful of these companies out there to use them uh, to monitor your blockchain transactions. Um, in comparison, and also to give kind of a wider perspective, if you are a regulated, regulated company, apart from anti-money laundering requirements, you have a handful of other things, like there are specific requirements uh, related to finances, uh, we're subject to uh, capital adequacy obligations uh, and management of our own company's assets and liabilities. Specifically, which I'd like to highlight is also safekeeping of and safeguarding of customer assets. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the context of also Japanese framework because they're a bit way more advanced um, than um, the situation here in EU at the moment. Also, there are all variety of governance requirements starting from regulated reporting and you would not believe how many reports I need to file um, on a regular basis to our regulator. Normally, at the beginning of the year, the first three months is just basically me working on a handful of various reports, collecting data, preparing, uh, visualizing it, and submitting to the regulators. Um, we are under the obligation to have various internal system controls. Um, there are managements of conflicts of interest. You need to also take account of the advertising and marketing that you release. You have to have sophisticated governance framework in, in, internally. Uh, all the decision making needs to go through formal processes, etc. These things need to be documented and auditable in the end. About the anti money laundering and KYC requirements, I already spoke about. So there's a handful of things that we're subject to, but as, as you can see, just a small bit or just one part of the bigger picture. Uh, there are also risk requirements, and not only do we need to conduct a risk assessment of our own customers, we also have to look at the risk on a more kind of enterprise level where we need to factor market liquidity, 
investment, credit, operational risk, fraud risk, etc. So there are a lot of factors to consider here. Um, and there are many more other categories involved, like outsourcing requirements, IT obligations, etc., which are also written in the law and which we as a regulated company need to comply with. So here I would like to share a few insights of what is commonly uh, identified by regulators when they perform on-site visits and do on-site audits of institutions. And there are generally four categories where Custom, uh, where companies quite frequently fail. So I'll start with uh, customer enterprise risk management. Quite often companies do not know what the risk appetite is uh, and have not performed any risk assessment on the enterprise level. And even if they have done that, they might have done it like five years ago. And obviously the risk landscape has changed and the identified risks are no longer re relevant. Moreover, quite often the methodology used is not adequate or uh, is not aligned with the applicable laws. And lastly, which is, I think, a bit specific to Luxembourg, but uh, we have here in Luxembourg an obligation to have a formal sign off for high risk customers. So whenever we onboard a high risk corporate or individual, I personally, as a CCO or any other chief executive officer, needs to approve that uh, customer. It has to be a manual process, which is a bit cumbersome um, given the um, regular onboarding volumes, but that's just a specificity of Luxembourg uh, regulation. In addition, uh, when we talk about customer due diligence, there are quite often a lot of failures here. First of all, obviously um, not being able to collect sufficient KYC documents on your customers. And even if collecting documents, not being able to understand those documents or appropriately interpret them, especially when you're onboarding corporate customers. You not only need to just do a tick box approach and collect the minimum requirements, you also need to understand the business of your customer and you need to ask the right questions and perhaps ask for the right documents as well. Also having lack of source of wealth or source of funds destinations and proof of that is a common problem. Um, uh, Moreover, when we talk about uh, KYC, this is not just a one-time exercise. This actually needs to be carried out uh, periodically. And there is more or less kind of an industry standard that you uh, review KYC for your high-risk customers on an annual basis. You check your medium customers every two years and you revise your low-risk customers every three years. Um, also, failures relate to uh, not applying enhanced due diligence. Again, if you're on board a high risk customer, that means that you need to uh, ask a bit more than uh, standard KYC information. You need to perform enhanced due diligence. If it's a politically exposed person or a high risk business, then you need to drill down a little bit deeper and identify a bit more information to be able to appropriately manage the risk that you're exposed to. Uh, when we talk about activity monitoring and reporting, again, there are multiple different failures here. Sometimes companies don't have appropriate tools to monitor the risks or compliance teams are not sufficiently involved. Um, if we talk about screening of customers, again, this is not a one-time exercise on the onboarding stage. You need to do it actually on an ongoing basis. You have to screen your customers basically daily or whenever the database that you're screening for is updated, especially if your home regulator has any specific lists and issues instructions to freeze uh, assets of certain individuals, then your system needs to rescreen your database against uh, that information. Again, uh, when it comes to uh, filing uh, suspicious activity reports, and this became very essential now with the Fixed Money Laundering Directive for all VASPs, you need to make sure that you are able to identify suspicious activity timely and also report it without delay. Um, and yeah, make sure that you actually file it because uh, among the failures, just like failing to report to the FIU. And lastly, uh, it's the lack of resources within the compliance function. So. Um, Quite often, and for a very long time, compliance was seen as a kind of a uh, cost generating department um, because it doesn't really generate revenue, even though if you look at it from a different perspective where the compliance team and you know having a strong compliance program prevents all sorts of penalties and um, um, charge to the company for a failure to comply, still 
uh, quite often compliance teams are neglected. They either have not necessary or sufficient resources or unable to have budget for sufficient controls and uh, programs in place to be able to manage the compliance risk. So that's also quite frequently among the problems. And that can be challenging for now for new VASP, so for new companies that have just launched their business, invest in a lot in various tools can be quite expensive because uh, having advanced uh, KYC technology, transaction monitoring technology, fraud monitoring technology, all of this requires money and increases the cost of onboarding your users. But in the end, uh, if you build a scalable system, you'll be better off because if you have um, kind of a very manual uh, program of checking customers, when you have a lot of customers, you won't simply be able to manage your risks. Um, so to kind of survive the fifth money laundering directive, you have to build a strong compliance program and the compliance strong compliance program stands on four pillars. It's having internal controls, which is your policies and procedures that are aligned with the law. Uh, it's the internal audit, which you can do by yourself in house, uh, but make sure that it is independent or preferably hire a third party form, uh, firm that will do the internal audit for you. Um, you have to have a designated compliance officer who is kind of a middleman between the company and the regulator who will take care of your compliance and make sure that the regulator is happy. And you also have to perform anti money laundering training for your employees on a regular basis, at least annually. You have to train them about your company's compliance program, about the threats, about the tools the company uses, and about all the uh, kind of uh, threats that the company faces specifically in your business area. Uh, so now I'll talk a little bit about um, Japanese and Luxembourg experience. So um, as I mentioned, uh, the company was actually had, uh, was founded in Japan and our headquarters is in Japan. So there are a few differences and obviously the regulation in Japan is a bit more established and the more advanced than it is in Europe because it's been around for quite a while. Uh, first of all, the registration and uh, you know, the definition of a VASP sort of was introduced in Japan uh, already in April 2017, while in Luxembourg we have it only this March in 2020. Uh, when it comes to customer protection rules, such as complaint resolution, transparency of information, disclaimers, etc., this is all part of the regulator framework specifically for crypto businesses, while for VASPs in Luxembourg, this is out of scope, only for regulated firms. Um, asset segregation, again, same thing. Uh, in Japan, they have provisions both for crypto asset segregation and fiat, which I will also talk a little bit more on the next slide. In EU, uh, especially in Luxembourg, again, asset segregation obligations are only for uh, already regulated entities like traditional financial institutions, not for VASPs, which are uh, only subject to anti-money laundering regulation. External audit, again, wide scope. Um, uh, requirements including asset segregation in Luxembourg this is now only for anti-money laundering if you're a VASP if you're a financial institution again this is nothing new uh, you are subject both to internal and external audits which cover all aspects of operations of the company um, also in Japan there is a requirement for separate license to operate der derivatives business with cryptocurrencies you need to have a type one financial instruments business operator license in Luxembourg and in general in EU, it falls under the MIFID type of licensing. And lastly, for KYC and anti money loan obligations, quite the same. Uh, there might be some kind of differences specific to the jurisdiction, but overall approach is more or less equivalent. And just to talk a little bit more about asset segregation, and this is again where I think Japan is quite advanced in terms of defining the requirements. So, what Japan is obliged to and any um, exchange operating in Japan has to do is to first of all separate customer assets into a cold wallet and roughly 95% of all customer assets in crypto has to be kept in a cold wallet. Also, moreover, you have to in general have cold wallets for each crypto that you provide in your exchange. That's like the ideal scenario. And then the remaining you can keep on hot wallet for operational needs to process withdrawals, for example. But at the same time, the company from its own reserve, from its own assets, need to have an equivalent amount in a cold wallet storage that is equal to the hot wallet customer uh, crypto um, uh, amount. So 
in, 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 and it's quite strict in Japan. So uh, for, for, for us, uh, for Big Flyer, it's quite imperative to comply with this. And it also brings a lot of protection to customers. So I think that's quite beneficial. I'd like to see something similar as well be introduced in Europe. Um, so what what does the future hold? So what's what's there for crypto uh, in EU? So quite recently, Bitflyer um, made a poll where we questioned around 10,000 people across Europe in 10 countries. Uh, and we asked a simple question, will cryptocurrencies be around in 10 years? And uh, we had a 66% positive response, uh, where Italy took the lead with 72 respondents being positive and UK being the most pessimistic here with 56 respondents. This is actually a 3%, 3% increase from the previous year. Um, to me, this is indicative that uh, cryptocurrencies are becoming uh, known and widespread and going a bit into mainstream. And we can be confident that they're not going to go away especially with all the regulatory talks and all the regulated advancements. It's it's already here. Perhaps we're not going to use Bitcoin for payments maybe in 10 years, but it's definitely going to remain as a financial instrument uh, and will the cryptocurrency will become an integral part of the financial system. So I would like to give you sort of my three predictions for the next three years uh, for the crypto space in uh, Europe. First of all, the infamous travel rule, um, which has been debated and discussed a lot through the last year after the FATF uh, publication and guidance uh, last June in 2019. So right now, there's there are various discussions, there are solutions proposed, but still there are no strict requirements among regulators that would like to enforce the travel rule. But I think in three years' time, we'll definitely not only have a more or less workable solution, this would also be more stricter on a regulatory level and regulators would be uh, keen on pushing this and making sure that the companies comply. There are a lot of technical challenges with this because communicating originator and beneficiary information with the transaction is quite complex technically. And you have to ha have all the industry participate in this protocol. And it's, it's difficult to understand which uh, wallet belongs to uh, Avast, which does not. But... I think we will have solutions um, come in place and we simply will be will be obliged to comply. Second thing that I think is that while we have the six money laundering directive um, upcoming, what will happen is that the uh, anti-money laundering framework in EU will convert to regulation similarly as we have GDPR, for example, because even though the money laundering directive, the fifth one, had to be transposed and came into force on the 10th of January. The problem is that not all member states actually transpose it fully. Again, Luxembourg is an example that even in March, it's generally partially transposed. So to be more effective, I think in that sense, the directive would be converted to regulation so that everyone has to comply straight away, leaving no room for interpretations, but uh, at least introducing more harmonization. And lastly, uh, now we have a lot of vast frameworks across many um, jurisdictions. So only now it's just registration and subjecting companies to anti-money laundering. But I think that that framework will be converted to regulation or to kind of wider requirements than we have now. Um, because many companies that operate in this sphere um, are operating more or less a traditional business model uh, with just this kind of aspect of dealing with cryptocurrencies. So I think it's just a matter of time when this turns into a more sophisticated regulation. Um, that's it for me. I'll leave you with a quote from um, unknown wise compliance man uh, uh, we, who said at some point that companies do not get fined for money laundering. Uh, companies get actually fined for failing to have adequate policies. Uh, the right procedures are on the ability to follow those policies and procedures. I've read this quote in front of regulators and they did agree that that is the case. So in case you have policies derived from the law, procedures derived from the policies and your staff is adequately trained and follows the procedures, you should be safe to go because nobody can eradicate money laundering completely. It's still going to slip through somehow through the cracks. But as long as you have this uh, program in place, then you should be on the safe side. Um, 
Otherwise, you need to uh, put a lot of emphasis on making sure that um, your program is adequately structured. That's it for me. Uh, I'd be happy to answer some questions uh, once uh, you know, we have the Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll leave the floor to uh, other panelists now. Thank you, Ivar. The presentation was super interesting. I think Europe has a lot to take from Japan and learn from them as well. Um, for me specifically and for the viewers, I think it's important to know why. For example, because of all the reasons you mentioned companies fail, these four specific reasons, all of them seem like it's because businesses are overlooking the importance of compliance internally. And one of your recommendations at the end was, you know, pay more attention to compliance. But for the viewers who are now watching and who are going to present this information to others in their team and the companies, how do you think they should get their attention and really help them uh, understand that it's actually related to uh, the revenue in the end of the day? And how would you say that the best way to transfer this information is? Uh, thank you. That's actually an excellent question. Uh, well. I am fortunate to have the management that really understands the importance of compliance, so I don't have to do a lot of convincing. Uh, but I, I believe that's not the case in every institution. I think what really works well in these circumstances is just to show some statistics or show some information about the recent fines for failures in uh, anti-money learning specifically, because that's where the biggest fines are. Just showing that and saying that that can be a cost which nobody wants to budget for the future should already be a good motivator um, for a company to kind of provide a little bit of budget, extra budget for compliance tools. Additionally, um, I think it's also very important to explain to management that uh, building a program that's scalable is very important because you might invest a little bit more now, but you'll have to invest way less later on once your business grows. Because otherwise, if your uh, program relies on human interactions and human labor, you won't be able to grow your team quickly enough to address the growing volumes of your of your company. Um, and then changing legacy systems is just a nightmare. So uh, I think it's very important to talk to management because the tone has to come from the top. Um, and it's also, yeah, it kind of comes down to the skills of the uh, person you have in charge as a compliance officer and his kind of persuasive uh, abilities uh, to convince the management. Thanks. I think that was a great answer. So I would like to remind uh, all the webinar viewers to tweet their questions using at CryptoMood and the hashtags Bitcoin and hashtag cryptocurrencies for a chance to win $100 in crypto for the best questions. At the end, we're going to select which best question is. Uh, and um, now we're going to continue with our next interesting speaker. Uh, he's going to talk more about peak pay and the variety of attitudes towards cryptocurrencies in the European countries, as well as what challenges uh, are unique to the fiat crypto providers, the insights for these services and their demand over the last few years and into the future. I would like to welcome uh, Raido, who is going to continue from here. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for introduction. Also, uh, thank you, Ivars, for this very, very thorough overview about uh, regulations all over the world. As, yes, it's very impressive that you are, let's say, listed in three continents all over the world. And, and uh, your words about uh, becoming more uh, similar to Japan is a little bit uh, frightening because as I saw their regulations are really tougher than they are at the moment in Europe but uh, you actually took um, most of the words and most of the slides I wanted to present uh, about AMLD5 so thank you very much so I can do it a little bit shorter and I have no need to show the same slides you already showed because actually you took it you concluded it very pretty nicely a couple of words about peakspay uh, peakspay is actually has a trademark on the market already 50 year 
and we have seen the changing of regulations uh, through those years and uh, according to those changes we have been changing our platform as well so uh, on the on the second half of uh, 2018 we understood that actually even if the law will allow it it's not possible to serve customers which have not going through full kyc uh, we uh, switched on mandatory uh, kyc with our kyc partner that time berif estonian startup and uh, it resulted with 84 percent of all uh, uh, of signing up new customers uh, we were pretty worried because first of all uh, we wanted to avoid fraudsters to use our service but uh, we wanted to have new customers anyway but uh, we faced the problem that uh, many our customers uh, it was only less than two years ago weren't uh, interested to show their documents and uh, to identify themselves in in uh, normal level but uh, surprisingly next month all the uh, customers were back so uh, it was a shock probably for many of our customers because uh, we all coming from the era when bitcoin was supposed to be something a pair to pair something uh, giving you privacy that you can hold your assets uh, in your control uh, doing your uh, dealings inside a trustless environment where you don't need such trusted party which will give you credibility but uh, as law moves tough and becomes tougher and tougher then uh, as uh, you saw from Ivar's slide that uh, during AMLD4 and comparing AMLD4 to uh, AMLD5 um, most uh, aspects which used to be voluntary are now mandatory and that what it is and uh, when AMLD5 was forced on uh, uh, 9th of July 2018, uh, it ob obliged the uh, member states of European Union to uh, modify their regulations by the January 20, 2020. So uh, the move from uh, toward the tougher regulations is as we see it's happening and uh, as crypto market cap is growing and it's already significant enough to affect not only people but uh, organizations and markets and of course big brother wants to have his own cut so Pixpay was uh, going with going on with those uh, changes of regulations and that's why a big part of uh, last two years we have been actually implementing our internal procedures into machine so as Ivar said it's very important to have capability to monitor your uh, transactions and customers transactions it's uh, utmost important that you can do it automatically that machine knows how to detect uh, irregular uh, transactions and how to introduce to machine uh, when and how it has to react to some kind of transactions even if it's only a risk uh, level rise then it's so important because uh, our uh, manpower is not capable of doing that or otherwise we are not uh, scalable at all 
So instead of uh, coming out and coming live with new services, our two last years, we really focused on implementing those changes into the machine, building a fraud detection engine, also transaction monitoring engine. And uh, with uh, those tools, now we are capable of trusting our platform that if there is no alert, it means that uh, all risk aspects are in the level that the transactions can move automatically. Because without, uh, without those automat automatizations, we are not able to scale and onboard more customers. As uh, coming to Estonia and regulations, um, as you know, Estonia used to have around 3,000 licenses uh, last year. And then in expectation of AMLD5 uh, regulations uh, being enforced in Estonia, Estonian regulators were starting to change our regulations and also our financial intelligence unit started to uh, clear the market. So today uh, it's um, much more compl uh, complex to open a crypto company in Estonia. And if you do, it is really coming with different set of rules than it used to be uh, even last year. Uh, for us, who are owning those Estonian licenses, actually they are registrations, but those registrations now are really tough to, uh, to obtain as the regulations have been turned off. But uh, to give you some statistics, I took it from uh, Estonian Financial Intelligence Unit and they, uh, uh, they op discovered me uh, information that uh, uh, since the end of the last year has been cancelled 487 uh, virtual asset exchange licenses and 456 uh, virtual currency wallet offering uh, licenses. So basically 500 co uh, companies have been losing their licenses because it's very regular that uh, Estonian companies which were sold here, uh, like uh, shell companies, they had those licenses and the price of those companies varied from 800 euros to 1200 euros. Of course, for 1200 euros, you already got it, uh, what you're really supposed to have with all regulations and all the paperwork done for this uh, certain company. But actually, even this is not enough in uh, today's uh, legal environment. Today's legal environment, uh, as uh, we have been uh, discussing with Estonian Financial Intelligence Unit, uh, this is what they meant is that uh, if we have in Estonia so many uh, registered companies uh, which have uh, crypto registrations, then uh, they will bring us, uh, uh, they will hurt us in um, PR level so bad if those companies are, uh, 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 are letting um, money laundering happening that uh, that this is not just acceptable for Estonian Republic. So they started to think how to change it. And uh, they had negotiations and consultations with Estonian cryptocurrency associations. And we tried to give them our own practical view how to change the regulations. and. Uh, they explained us in uh, layman's terms that what they really expect from those companies which are having Estonian regulations, uh, re registrations. So 
the main thing is that I really want that the company dealing with virtual assets will have uh, office in Estonia and they have uh, AML uh, officers working in Estonia, getting paid in Estonia and uh, they are reachable for them because their main problem is that uh, there are many companies which have Estonian registration and they don't have even contact person who they can reach and also today brief before our webinar i talked to financial intelligence unit and they said that even companies which have uh, lost their licenses they are still operating and showing on their websites that they have this license which actually is already uh, revoked so they they are worried that those companies are out of their reach and in the different uh, legal uh, environment so they can actually they cannot actually even do their duty to to keep an eye and control those companies so uh, when um, amld5 uh, regulations were uh, put in force in estonia on 10th March this year, it uh, came with pretty big uh, changes in requirements of the law. And uh, if it used to be uh, 300 euros uh, uh, opening fee for a crypto company, then now it's 3000. Minimum required capital for such a company is 12,000 euros. And of course, the main uh, main question is that AML officer must be really on the level, and it must be someone who really has experience on the field. As uh, I have been working in my life seven years in, uh, in a border guard department in border intelligence, so I I pretty much understand how they think and uh, what they expect from uh, service providers uh, so having this uh, inside view I, I understand what they expect from us but also i understand that uh, there are many things which are still unclear for the regulators and they need uh, practical input from companies uh, who are providing virtual services, virtual asset services. So, um, uh, when uh, new regulations were uh, to put on in force in Estonia, uh, we had a meetings in uh, cryptocurrency associations, and many foreign companies had uh, like real issues with how they can continue operating with Estonian uh, Estonian regulations when they even have to give answers to regulators questions in Estonian it created a new kind of uh, service that legal bureaus started to offer so-called uh, we will answer your compliance questions to regulator uh, it was pretty popular, I understand, but as you see, 500 companies failed to answer those questions, so they have been losing their registrations. But uh, uh, in uh, meetings, uh, uh, wh which were in in Estonia, in crypto communities, uh, really legal bureaus tried to offer uh, like virtual AML officer services for companies which are actually not operating in Estonia and you know, would like to keep those registrations. So um, for in, in my view, it's uh, something like that, that uh, if some hospital has uh, a surgeon and uh, he wrote the instruction, how do you pre perform a surgery and then some other people are reading this manual and doing the surgery. I, I think that I wouldn't like to be such a patient in their table. 
but uh, this is something uh, similar what happens in uh, uh, in the point of view of our regulator that if uh, you are buying in uh, aml officer service it's actually from practical point of view it's impossible because this is ongoing going um, uh, it's everyday job and you really those questions are everyday different and you really have to know your practice you know you have to know how your company operates you have to understand the mechanics and uh, inner view of your company and this is not something that uh, you can do like once a week this is everyday everyday job thank you thank you Raido. that's great closing remarks uh, we're a bit short on time, but uh, at the end, we're also going to take questions. I'm sure that there will be plenty for you as well to give us more input about the topic. I would like to remind also all the viewers to go on Twitter and tweet using the at CryptoMood and the hashtag Bitcoin, also hashtag cryptocurrency for a chance to eat $100 if you ask a question that would be chosen as the best question at the end of the Q&A session by our speakers. Next, I would like to also thank our media partners, Delta Heroes, The Capital.io magazine, Bitcoin Courier for their immense support and growth hacking ideas. Uh, we're going to continue with Robert Steinadler, who is the editor-in-chief at The Bitcoin Courier. He'll talk about the crypto news industry, the censorship on content creators, and the willingness of regulators to work with content creators. I'll pass on the floor to you, Robert. Thank you, and also thanks for the invitation. Um, I like to keep it short. Um, what, what I like to talk about is um, really the impact of uh, regulation or missing regulation on crypto media. First, a couple of words um, about Bitcoin Courier. I started Bitcoin Korea in uh, 2018 as a blog. I am personally uh, a GPU miner, or that uh, was uh, the way how I started with cryptocurrencies in general. So I wanted to start a blog, um, yeah, just uh, about my experiences as a miner. And I figured that people came for news. So um, I developed Bitcoin Korea into a news magazine and changed the direction. And um, yeah, crypto journalism or crypto media, what, what, what is crypto journalism in, in general? Um, you have four groups um, in the field, influencers, podcasters, bloggers and journalists. Um, and the audience basically choose their, their favorite media on trust. Why it is it so important to trust somebody in uh, cryptocurrencies? People need a trusted source of information because the market is not regulated. Um, it's, a, it's a regular question to ask yourself, is a coin or a token legitimate? Is the developer trustworthy? Are exchanges uh, scamming people for their money? Um, just remember Cryptsy or Minpal or Mt. Gox. Um, this isn't necessarily uh, the case in a regulated environment. Yeah? You don't need a credible source to estimate if a stock or a security is legitimate. This is already done um, by the regulatory bodies, right? So financial authorities oversee the market and all those steps already have been taken. You just have to ask yourself, um, is the security good of investment or not? So to me, the very job of crypto media is to inform the reader, not only about current events, but it also it steps in and informs the audience about wrongdoings or malicious actors or um, IT related uh, security issues. Um, let's take a look at um, what to expect if, if you're if you're trying to <laughs> achieve this goal and um, yeah and get get some some real information um, to to inform the readers about what's going on. Um, I'm going to start this in September 2018, uh, when a court in Berlin ruled that uh, Bitcoin is not a unit of account, currency, or e-money. Therefore, it, is, it was not covered by the German Banking Act. In effect, the defendant, um, the operator of Bitcoin24, a German Bitcoin exchange that was shut down in 2014, was a free man. 
But the most interesting part was that the court said that financial authorities weren't in charge in the first place. Sounds kind of convincing. Um, the asset is not under the Banking Act. Overseers have no saying. And the prosecution was wrong. But despite the fact um, that the court ruled that the BaFin, uh, German regulatory body, um, made it clear that, that they are not in charge, their stance was, well, we cannot effectively prosecute with criminal charges, but we still hold the power to apply administrative law. And so our companies still need our approval and a license for their business. This was intriguing. And in the aftermath, um, many companies started to operate Bitcoin ATMs. Um, you might have noticed that, that Germany um, hasn't many Bitcoin ATMs over, over all the years while this business was growing um, all over Europe and in the world. Germany um, was going dark, basically. So um, I spoke to one uh, company, um, to a spokesperson there, and uh, they made it clear that they are seeking a regulated environment and that they would like to comply. But um, yeah, there, there, there weren't any uh, framework for them whatsoever. And also, um, since it was clear that they couldn't throw them into jail, they just started their business. And uh, yeah, they, they went from there just to see what's going to happen. Um, I tried to contact the BaFin about the same issue. And I found that they replied in a timely manner, also very polite. And they were aware of the issue, but instead to um, clarifying things, they simply just chose to reiterate their position um, on the matter and were completely ignoring the controversy. So the lack um, of communication from regulatory bodies was due to missing laws. Since, our, uh, since the new laws uh, came into effect, we, the situation has changed. Um, many regulations came into effect in March 2020 here in Germany, and they came along with um, AML D5. And ever since, um, the situation has been more positive. BaFin is more, um, they are more communicating um, what to expect if you like to apply for a license. And um, of course, they also, <clears throat> excuse me, they also shut down all non-compliant Bitcoin ATMs. <clears throat> but this time, um, knowing that the law was fully on their side. So you see, um, it's, it, it is not um, always easy uh, to, to um, operate in this field since a um, couple of things were more political issues than, than issues for the um, regulators themselves. So they, they, they hadn't the law on their side. They knew that new laws uh, were in the making and that they were coming and that they were necessary. Um, so they had to handle the situation somehow. At least that's what I figured out. Um, another sector where um, I think uh, it was about censorship, um, I wouldn't really call it censorship. Um, as I said before, many, many um, people um, that belong to crypto media are influencers or bloggers. So they are dependent on social media, YouTube or Twitter or whatever. And um, those people get, get not banned because um, there's some kind of censorship going on. I would really think that this is fraud protection. Um, we, we had um, difficult situations with Facebook ads. We had a couple of cases where YouTubers um, got their channels shut down. And most of that was also because, um, yeah, I guess because uh, the, the whole thing isn't really well regulated um, nowadays. So uh, they, they, the, the companies have somehow, somehow to make sure that um, malicious actors with uh, shady advertisement or um, some kind of um, fraudulent offers that they um, are banned from their platforms. And somehow um, this always uh, uh, ends up that you um, yeah, catch the wrong people. And in some cases, 
um, they have uh, their channels shut down or they're not capable of um, using regular advertisements uh, because their, their crypto product is not deemed um, uh, compliant. So um, this, 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 just a, a short outlook uh, from me. And um, yeah, <laughs> that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, there were some very nice points in there. Uh, I'm particularly interested actually in uh, the regulation around uh, basically content creators. And as you mentioned, also people who want to put up advertisements on Google ads and Facebook as well. Do you think that the current regulation is uh, sufficiently clear enough, you know, for those companies to create basically uh, a structure for accepting more uh, players in the market to be able to use their services? Uh, it seems like uh, even with the current explanations put out on the website, it's very vague and the certification process that one has to go through just to be able to advertise on those platforms also doesn't seem to work uh, easy or even like fast for the people who need it the most. So do you think the regulation is uh, sufficiently clear for the companies to work with that? Or is it just their reluctance to accept companies to come on board and advertise those uh, companies? Well, um, I guess that, uh, <clears throat> I guess that um, they, they, they um, just need to, um, they, they 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 need a they need to uh, open up to the to 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 the to the whole thing and i already i think that 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 already has happened so we 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 had um a a couple of um different situations um especially with facebook first they allowed those ads then they took a step back and um this this was back and forth and i think that this shows that there th there are insecurities and i believe that um the more um the the whole market gets regulated the more they are willing to open up themselves to to um, to this matter yes yeah of course uh, for me, it seems like if you look at the most influential media out there in the in this sector specifically, uh, if you look at rankings like the Rise 100, Coin Telegraph and Coin Desks are at the top of the influential media there, right? But when mm -hmm. you go to websites, you also notice that a lot of the articles are actually sponsored, uh, and you know it's small yeah. letters, small letters. You don't really pay attention to most of the time. Um, but to me, it seems like that's the predominant part of the content on those websites. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how uh, informational uh, that is or how much it goes in the direction that mm -hmm. you mentioned that this kind of content creators should promote wrongdoings, malicious acts, rather mm -hmm. than supporting uh, right companies that are, haven't been checked and only putting some, uh, you know, uh, information from the lawyers that they, they were required to put, right? Uh, I mean, so it, it, to me, it seems like regulations are missing. Uh, for, for those actors to, to play well. Uh, and uh, it also seems like the content creators aren't going the right direction either. They're just trying to monetize the situation. Well, um, I think that we, we are also running sponsored content, but it's clearly visible. There is a disclaimer on top and um, there, there, there's no, no, um, no way that uh, our audience uh, get gets confused about what is an advertisement and what is an actual article. So um, I think this is an ethical question. You know, would, you, would you rather um, fool your readers into thinking that this is um, journalism or would you just plainly and simply explain to them, uh, well, this is an article we get paid for, we need to make a living. And uh, this is the information that we would like to provide. Now, um, cryptocurrencies, especially cryptocurrencies, and this is uh, um, widely criticized, are um, a field, or especially the crypto media, is a field where there is more marketing than journalism, mm -hmm. which is basically true. Um, there is also not many talk, uh, topics to talk about. You can have tech talk and talk about um, structure of a coin or a smart contract and, and upcoming um, 
updates or upgrades or whatever. Um, you have talks about um, regulatory issues. Um, what is the direction of um, yeah, the whole market, where are we going? Are, are we going to see finally institutional money or whatever coming uh, with, with new product, products and regulation? And the third thing that you have is, is basically the same uh, with, with uh, news about the stock market. It's a uh, number go up or number go down. People are interested, uh, highly interested uh, where, where the market is uh, going in terms of price. So, um, Besides of these three things, and maybe some some news that are entertaining about um, I don't know from um, people on Twitter or or I don't know Craig Wright or some some something like that. Um, those things um, are, are are really news. They are news related. There there is a topic. Everything else is. Uh, sooner or later driven by, by uh, public rela relations, that, that is the case. But um, I, th I don't think that this is only um, a point for, for crypto media, but um, perhaps for media in general. Um, in, uh, if you think about that, um, a lot of, of uh, crypto media outlets are just mere influencers, right? And, and usual influencers, uh, I don't know, they, they advertise for Gucci sweaters. And in, in cryptocurrency, um, they tell you um, if, 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 if a project is trustworthy and um, what to do and how to react uh, to, to, to uh, changes on the market. And by the way, they're going to show you some ref links. And yeah. Um, well, we never know if in the end of the day, they don't own a piece of the coins and tokens in the background, you know. <laughs> but, uh, with the regulation in place, you're going to always have information about that. All right, thank you, Robert. We're gonna go forward with our next speaker. Uh, I would like to, before that, just remind the viewers to go on Twitter and use at CryptoMood as well as the hashtags Bitcoin and hashtag cryptocurrency for a chance to win $100 by asking questions that will be uh, then uh, reviewed by our speakers in the Q&A session at the end. And the best question wins $100 once again. So uh, our next speaker, uh, Nikolai Temchuk, and he'll discuss the conflicts between existing laws and cryptocurrencies and uh, where this is going in the near future. I give you the word. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Good day to everyone. Uh, I will start with a brief introduction of myself. Um, so I finished the master's degree on IT law in Estonia. And then I had been working for four years in a law firm called New York, which is a very strong technology law in Estonia. Uh, right now, uh, I do not represent any company, uh, so, but I still have startup and fintech clients uh, in Estonia to comply with Estonian and EU regulations. And mainly within these four years, I have been dealing with the fintech clients or technology clients in the blockchain and cryptocurrency field. And uh, when I look back to 2016 and right now, there are actually a lot of changes related to uh, legislation, but also there are many, many gray zones or there are many, many um, uh, technologies or situations which are still uh, not regulated and there is a big question whether the regulation needs to be in place at the moment or it's still too early. So I'm going to talk about three, um, my agenda is to cover three topics. The first one, um, I was given a conflict and then, but I would not call it a conflict. I would rather call it the challenges between the existing law and the technology. Let's put it this way. Uh, another topic I'm going to talk about the demand for legal services in cryptocurrency industry. And the third one is some prediction on the future law uh, for cryptocurrency. Uh, so, based on my experience, what I see, I see that uh, we have actually uh, two sides that impact each other. Um, and the pushes for the full development. It's easy, we have a new technology, 
that already has a big impact on the society and regulators legislator needs to act needs to produce some new law uh, or uh, we have a legislation that creates a new law and as a technology needs to adapt to this new regulation the first challenge what i see uh, and what is still not really clear is about smart contracts and whether it is the same uh, whether they have the same enforceability and the same legal status as a contract in electronic form or with a contract um, before starting about this also let me tell you that i might be jumping from one jurisdiction to another because uh, the legislation covering cryptocurrency is fragmented in european union and we have for example three i always highlight the three countries that have very different regulations one which is estonia and which is basically a regulation with the aml extension is not anything new coming from the aml directive then we have a gibraltar that has a regulation which is based on principle and this is a bit more comprehensive and then we have very very comprehensive regulation and which we see the three acts and which are adopted in Malta. so i'll be jumping around this uh, country so about smart contracts so far uh, taking that into consideration most of the countries and uh, also estonia it does not really fulfill the um, requirement to be considered to be like a written contract or a contract which is uh, concluded in the electronic form that might be enforceable for example in the court uh, because of the two issues. The first one is when you are going into the contract, you usually need to know the parties or your counterparty with whom you're actually excluding the contract. And the second issue is a signature. Uh, about the first issue, usually smart contracts are half included based on public key infrastructure. There is a public key, private key, you sign it and the contract is done. Most of the case, you do not know who is actually this counterparty that is also signing the contract. But this problem might be solved because it's possible, and right now there are also many exchanges and the service providers that are also doing KYC. So if you know, for example, that you are going to uh, uh, into the contract with the person, and you can also know who is this person. So some KYC provider or off online KYC or offline KYC, then it's okay. But the second issue is coming about electronic signature. And in Europe, we have either regulation that actually says what are those signatures that has the highest uh, security that can be used to sign uh, digitally documents, etc. Uh, in Estonia, it is a, a Estonian digital signature. It's a chip that we have in our IDs, uh, which actually gives you this private key to sign documents, and it's considered to be the same uh, process as you sign the documents manually. Uh, but when it comes to smart contracts, also using public key infrastructure, uh, it lacks the central authority that actually. Uh, gives uh, certificates for trust providers to uh, to sign those documents because it's actually decentralized nature. So here we have a first context where we can say that maybe either regulation infringes the principle of technology neutrality, a principle of functional equivalence, because in the end of the day, uh, public key infrastructure that is used by smart contracts is the same secure level as any other trust providers certified by in accordance with those regulations but smart contracts are not considered to have the same level of signature as those trust providers another uh, challenge that i see when it comes to cryptocurrency of course it's crypt blockchain because usually cryptocurrency built on blockchain is blockchain system and gdpr regulations relation data protection um, starting from actually who is the data controller and who is the data processor is it the node 
is the data subject. Also about the theoretical scope uh, of the GDPR, but we know that it applies to companies that are registered in European Union or those companies that offer the services or products or process the data of the European Union residents. Um, since nodes are usually um, uh, based all over the world and they might process your public key, which is also considered to be a pseudo anonymous data and considered to be personal data, it's rather difficult to limit the scope or actually to know uh, whether your personal data, if you're based in Japan, you based in Japan, will go beyond the theoretical scope. So this is another challenge. And of course, when it comes to GDPR, it's also right to amend, right to be forgotten, and right to data portability, which considering, for example, public blockchain, permissionless blockchain, it's rather so far uh, not possible to fulfill. But as you know, the data that is in the blockchain is not corruptible. It's not possible to go back uh, in the past and change something or add something. Another challenge that uh, I see right now, uh, very sexy actually, uh, topic is about uh, guidance uh, made by FASP about travel rules uh, for uh, virtual asset service providers or for cryptocurrency uh, exchange and cryptocurrency custodian wallet providers. Uh, it was adopted in June last year, so it's on already one year since it was adopted, and, um, and it was actually deadline also one year, so it should have been actually uh, all those companies need to follow it, like need to follow it. Uh, but it's just a guidance, but if the national state implements it right into the national legislation, the country seems to be ready actually to fulfill uh, this requirement. And this is fair from the point of view that right now, all financial institutions such as payment institutions, EMI institutions, banks are already doing this when they with their funds they often transact some data on the customer, its name, address, ID code, etc. Um, but this is the case where legislation impacts technology because right now and there are many developments going on, one of which uh, uh, which is the uh, IVMC 110, when the technology needs to work on and to create something new actually to fulfill this requirement to be able these funds transferred in blockchain also transfer some personal data such as usually when it comes to originator its name account number identity number date of birth and the address um, so let's see how it will be uh, so far, I, I know only about this. There are many groups that are working on this. And in blockchain, we have different blockchains. How is it possible actually to do it? Uh, complicated. Another uh, hot topic uh, uh, when it comes to cryptocurrency in particular, uh, we have, first of all, a cryptocurrency is ideal world. Then we have tokens, which ha might have different nature. And depending on the nature of the legislation, we also apply and then we have a new uh, very popular um, phenomenon right now is stable coins that are very popular to use and many uh, people and there are also some allegations uh, from the competent authority all over the world that stable coins most probably or have the features of e-money and again if it's considered to be a money then it's totally different regulation applies much more burdensome than those that applies for virtual uh, currency storage providers because it's a share capital. If we are talking about uh, European Union and e-money directive, which is 350,000 uh, 300, 350, euros, uh, much more strictly in terms of AML, KYC compliance, uh, etc. Um, so uh, at the moment, so I do not see very clear if we can say that the e-money can be, uh, that stablecoin can be e-money, but there are the law, there are three requirements saying that usually it's a fund that stores on electronic medium, and then you present the claims against the issuer. Usually it's issued by Parwell, Par uh, it's 
a it is a payment instrument and it is accepted by uh, someone else except the issue. Uh, so this, if this requirement are fulfilled, the reason there is a stable coin might actually fall under not a cryptocurrency regulation, but the, uh, the regulation of e-money, which is related to like representation of fiat money. Um, I will not talk. Uh, I will not talk so deeply about the other conflicts. I'm just mentioning it because it's rather not related to cryptocurrency, but something which is beyond. It is about investment. Is the equity tokens and shares? Is it the same? How is possible to implement? Because so far there is no infrastructure to actually do IPO fully issued by tokens. Uh, and there are also different points of view on cryptocurrency uh, derivatives. Some countries say that it fulfills uh, the national legislation and it must be regulated, licensed investment for the investment period must be uh, obtained. Others has as a gray zone, say nothing. About the demand uh, of legal services in the cryptocurrency sphere, I, I see it even though, uh, uh, because, uh, but, Cryptocurrency has been with us already 12 years. Many were saying before it's a bubble. We see it's not. It has its needs in the financial market. It has its customers. And it's not that much uh, of uh, uh, of use by many uh, ordinary people uh, as it was expected before. Uh, so this is actually the biggest problem right now. That's not not a lot, but like very little people actually use cryptocurrency. Let's be honest. But it has its niche. It's somehow very slowly developing, and it will be on the market. And since it's also developed, it's more relation comes into place. But there is a more actually legal work for lawyers, and I feel this demand because right now um, I'm like not working for a law uh, for a law firm, but uh, I constantly get uh, inquiries from different uh, fintech to help with the law, and they always say, "Do you know what is stable coin?" Do you know what is blockchain? Do you know how it works? Which is also what the case when I was approached by a consulting company saying that they got a very experienced compliance officer into their cryptocurrency exchange, but he has only experience with the traditional banks institutions. He does not really understand technology, so we would need some consulting to him to actually explain what is cryptocurrency, what are the risks there, and stuff like this. And about the prediction um, for the future, um, I think. I, remark Nicola like about the predictions and we can also move to the questions because there is a lot of questions from the audience okay um, uh, what uh, what the future what I see I see that um, it will be uh, more regulation related to cryptocurrency especially in terms of for example if we talk about European Union level there is only IML based like IML requirements I think that we will see more disclosure requirements for cryptocurrency service provider and requirements uh, related to security, such as like IT systems, which is very well actually written by Maltese uh, Mutual Financial Asset Act. And I think that uh, this is very, very good and comprehensive regulation, but at the same time very costly for businesses. So that's why most of the businesses are leaving master. Um, so yeah, so basically it's it. I think, uh, I think that uh, what it needs to be done that whatever regulation comes, it needs to fulfill the principle of technology neutrality. It should not hinder innovation. So I do not want to over-regulate this industry, but it's developing. And I think the pace of its development is actually good at the moment. Great. Thank you for this nice summary uh, of uh, crypto and law relationships. I would like to uh, say to everybody still listening, do not forget to go on the iStore or Play Store and download CryptoMood, the fundamental app for analyzing sentiment in the crypto market. Uh, try it out and tell us if you like it. Also, go on Twitter and for the last chance to submit your questions that will be asked in the Q&A uh, in a few minutes. The best question wins $100 and we'll select the, question, uh, the best question at the end of the Q&A. So stay tuned to see if you win $100 in cryptocurrency. Now, I'm going to start asking the questions. And for the speakers, uh, if you would like to just volunteer who wants to answer the question, uh, if that basically would be it. That would be much easier than if we all go in rounds and answer the same question. So just you know, raise your hand and 
if you want, just jump in and answer the question. So um, for all of you guys, uh, given that you have all the experience and knowledge about compliance, do you think all the exchanges and small time payment getaways in the EU are ready to comply with and enforce regulations? So who of the speakers would like to volunteer to jump on this question? Should I repeat it once more, maybe? I to be honest, please repeat the question because we didn't really get it. Yes, okay. So, uh, uh, given all the experience you have and knowledge about compliance, do you think all the exchanges and small-time payment getaways in the EU are ready to comply with and enforce such regulations? How ready do you think they are? All right, Redo, you raised your hand first. Go for it. Yes, uh, answer is very simple. No, uh, we have already seen it in Estonia when, for example, companies, even the even trading companies, uh, they who are working with uh, algorithm-based or bot-based trading, they used to be even uh, non-obliged entities uh, in the eyes of the law, but now they will not get a license because it's not enough if you have technical understanding of a platform and the service might be very good but uh, it's not enough they really require at least in estonia that uh, you have compliance officer even better team which daily basis is working with aml questions so the future probably as anonymity will be diminished even more than now uh, future will be that without uh, let's say big machine behind your small service you are not able to provide your service and let's say for small service it's uh, not sustainable model mm -hmm. thank you Radel. that was a very good answer i think uh, let's see what uh, people are also asking next so uh, what will happen to peer-to-peer peer-to-peer -peer crypto exchanges similar to local Bitcoin? Will they bow to regulations or die? Will the new regulations mean the end of the era of anonymity in crypto trading? Who is interested in answering that? Rado? Anyone else? No. Uh, any of ours, if you want, maybe just so that everybody speaks. Um. Yeah, maybe if I can jump jump in. So, um, yeah, I uh, I actually um, know the CCO of local Bitcoin, so I know for them like adopting the new anti money loan directive was challenging. But I think my my vision of the regulation is that uh, for the whole industry to advance further in adoption and use cases, uh, I think regulation is necessary and some compliance with anti money loan requirements is just a necessity. Uh, because without that, there will always be debate that cryptocurrencies are a gateway for money laundering, that uh, they are used by criminals. And, you know, to for us to change the reputation of the cryptocurrency industry, it's just imperative that the companies comply with the regulation. Mm -hmm. And when speaking about the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platforms, uh, still KYC thresholds need to be established. Obviously, perhaps there are some... Um, some not to say like loopholes but some flexibility across the eu uh that would allow like for example simplified due diligence to be carried out something that we do at bitflyer for example uh where certain you know what the customer meets certain criteria so there will be some kind of entry uh for customers that is quite easy and is not cumbersome in terms of kyc but i still think that for us to see advancements uh regulation is simply simply something that you know will happen all right if, Thank you. If, I, if i may add here uh, um, as you all know uh, when you have been uh, in uh, crypto events or crypto symposiums all over the world then there are people who really believe in the beginning of crypto and the meaning of the crypto and uh, what satoshi actually meant uh, in his white paper to give people independent mean of payment or rule their assets we are very far from that already and uh, there is a real threat for regulators that if they will turn those uh, the, this air 
if they close it too tightly, uh, many of the businesses go under the floor. And uh, when there was uh, planning of a change of Estonian crypto regulations, I, I told them, please don't start to regulate pair to pair crypto exchanges because actually they can do their business without you knowing it. If uh, as stronger will build, be the laws, the darker they go. And uh, it's, uh, it's probably the way that if regulator returns it over, then uh, many of such comp uh, businesses will just disappear from the radar. Great, thanks. Uh, for, thanks for the input, uh, Rado. Uh, the next one, a bit shorter. Does AMLD5 affect me if I'm not a European citizen? Uh, MLD5 uh, is a directive and it needs to be uh, transported into the national law of every country and it applies for businesses. And the question is about individual. Uh, the, the question is not really clear. But if the business is uh, based in country where they need to conduct uh, customer due diligence, then every customer needs to be KYC. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nikolai. Uh, great, uh, great answer. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. So, uh, what steps can small businesses take to thrive in this new crypto environment brought about by new regu regulatory requirements? So, maybe just a quick take on what should be the action plan for a small business to not get caught too fast. <laughs> uh, um, if I may start. Um... Because I also uh, agree with Raido, I was working as a lawyer in Estonia, and uh, what I see and uh, um, that many of those who have applied for the license and why many were revoked, it's not maybe even just because they were not ready to comply with the law. It is the reason, but uh, it's where there were many, many um, companies uh, that were applying for these licenses without really understanding whether they need such a license, whether the service they provide actually falls under the uh, license to be a virtual currency service provider. So this is uh, uh, one question. And many, many companies, I don't know why, but they have an image of Estonia that's very easily to come. Maybe it was also because it was created by many consulting companies um, that were very willing to sell to everyone those licenses. But if you come to Estonia, you pay 10K, 15K, and you have a company with licenses and you can do business, which was the past, which was partially true. The main true and uh, the licensing cost is not actually expensive. The most expensive cost in this business is to be ready to set up a uh, good and um, uh, process of AML and KYC. Because this is for, for sure you need to outsource something. You need to have team on board who will do it on a daily basis. And many of the uh, businesses, they do not understand how important it is and how bad it is. So this is actually the main problem. And if you are going to open such a business which falls under the licensing or registration, be sure that you also need to have a good understanding of IML compliance and a good uh, internal process in your company, how to actually do it on practice. Uh, great, thanks for that. So small businesses prepare, uh, invite a compliance officer before you do invite an HR officer to your company when starting out. I think that will be more important in the future, especially when hiring people so that they know how to comply with everything once on board. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on to another great question from the audience. Are there any records, database or blacklists the exchanges share in order to prevent money laundering? Uh, attempts on different exchanges. So is there a database uh, that would help uh, prevent money laundering attempts on different exchanges? Yeah, actually, there's this is a topic with, that I would like to address. So uh, that's actually a very, very interesting question. I think where uh, the blockchain industry and the cryptocurrency exchanges are a little bit different from traditional finance institutions. Uh, there aren't at least i'm not aware of like a you know a known circulating blacklist of customers uh across exchanges but uh there are several initiatives facilitated by 
uh, blockchain forensics tools, uh, such as that, you know, elliptic chain analysis or alike. Um, so unlike uh, with traditional finance, obviously exchanging information through FIUs is not really possible and you cannot like create blacklists. But what can happen on the blockchain um, with the analytics tools is that the fraudulent addresses can get flagged on the blockchain. And we as an exchange can also contribute, for example, if we identify a fraudster or a criminal on our exchange and he has used the wallet uh, to you know, process his uh, coin transactions, we can actually flag it internally and he also can communicate it to the kind of network or to the data set of the provider that we use for blockchain analytics. And that will be spread out across all their clients. So if, for example, a blockchain forensics tool uh, has, you know, Coinbase, Kraken, you know, some other large exchanges clients, and they all submit their fraudulent addresses, if that person goes from one exchange to another sure. and uses the same addresses, they will get flagged and their transaction will be probably stopped or uh, assets will be frozen, uh, STRs will be filed. So I think this is a bit of a unique characteristic of the blockchain industry that we can benefit from the network sure. overall, which is not really possible uh, with the existing you know, traditional uh, reporting means with, through the FIUs. Yes, very nice point there. Uh, thanks for this uh, answer. Uh, we have a few more interesting questions, and uh, I think it uh, makes sense to go through all of them and then select the best uh, question that was asked. Just to remind the viewers, you can still submit some questions if you would like on our Twitter, on, on Twitter using at CryptoMood and the hashtags Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So uh, the next question is uh, one of our viewers is wondering, how do exchanges keep KYC AML documentation safe? I think Ivaris also can answer here as well, or? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer this as well. Well, this, this is nothing novel uh, in terms of information security. I think that's the same principle supplies uh, for any bank or any other finance institution where you have an account or you use on a regular daily basis. So we have to have uh, appropriate security and risk controls in place. You have to have, have a very good IT security team that uh, can identify the vulnerabilities with your new system. Uh, again, in Luxembourg, there are specific IT infrastructure requirements on how uh, the personal data needs to be kept safe uh, in your platform with all the security walls, isolated uh, infrastructures, et cetera. So there's nothing super, uh, there's no rocket science with this. This is quite, quite similar to any financial institution in terms of requirements. All right, great, thank you. Uh, okay, anybody else maybe want to jump in or we can move on? Okay, so uh, the next question uh, is uh, if uh, you, any of you expects that uh, in order to comply with the new regulation, uh, exchanges would be moving to other countries where no regulation and taxes are uh, present at those uh, jurisdictions, you know, uh, making them comply with, uh, with basically the trustless crypto ideas. More, I don't know if you understood more or less the question. So, do you expect exchanges to move to other countries because of this regulation? Um, and what will be the reaction? Okay, Rado. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's like a dream. Yes, let's go somewhere where there are no laws. We land on some uh, sh shiny, sunshiny island. There is one problem if you want to communicate with banks uh, from the real world. Uh, you will never be able to open an account uh, if you need to pay salaries or if you need fiat for your own expenses or whatever. Uh, you will not get the bank account or if you get the bank account, as you all know, there are some services which are providing bank accounts uh, in somewhere, nowhere, no, where. Um, basically, you will not be operable if you want to have business in uh, Europe or, or let's say, civilized world. So mm -hmm. basically, there is no way. This is just a dream. We all dream it someday, I guess. Okay, we're stuck with being regulated and having nothing to say about it. <laughs> I, may, I, may also, I may also add here, if I can. Yes, go for it. Please. Um, uh, I um, do relate to this question asked um, that, okay, if you have um, a very burdensome regulations and you will go to some offshore 
jurisdiction or jurisdiction which is, does not regulate anything and we will do our business. And this is really dangerous in terms of uh, consumer protection. Um, not every consumer is really aware um, that the consumer that, um, needs to really check the business, whether this business needs a license or how um, reliable the business is. Because for example, when I am going to use uh, any cryptocurrency service providers, I will always check if it's licensed, where it's registered, because if I'm going to invest my own money, I want to be sure that it's safe. So it's rather right now my advice to those users that are uh, watching us at the moment, that it would be companies that would leave countries or European Union to go to another jurisdiction which is not regulated. But be also aware that regulation for you, it's actually really good because it protects you, it gives you some kind of protection. And if you use the services of those unregulated entities somewhere else, it's a risk for you that if something happens, if it will be hacked and cryptocurrency will be stolen, most probably you will not get your funds back and there will not be liability for such company. The, the, uh, this is a topic that I want to chip in as well a little bit. Uh, just a great, really great question. Uh, yes, I think w while it might be for businesses enticing to go to like offshore jurisdictions because there might be kind of more um, relaxed approach to regulate crypto businesses. Again, as uh, Rido pointed out correctly, bank accounts will become a problem. They are a problem even for regulated institutions or for you know companies established in. European Union or elsewhere. Uh, and another thing is, yes, uh, if, if it's, it's also from the consumer perspective, like consumers would not really want to go to uh, shady exchanges because we have so many examples of where if there would have been some regulatory control, a lot of disasters could be avoided. Um, you know, a good example, which I like is the Canadian Quadriga CX. Uh, issue where there was uh, kind of one founder uh, of the of the exchange who presumably has died and he took all the keys uh, to the wallets with him and it's it's not acceptable in a normal regulated environment that only a single person has access to the all assets of the company so if if, if the company was properly regulated uh, obviously this risk would have been distributed and it would be kind of a multi-signature wallet there would be some redundancy uh, in place and that would never happen and people would not lose their money. So again, I think people already had enough of examples where companies fail just because they are somewhere where they are not regulated or at least not under the supervision of the regulators. Thanks. Thanks for the input. I'll, uh, I'll move on to the next question. Actually, we have three, three more, I think. So uh, what would be the best way for a crypto startup to acquire European customers without causing them to drop out during the onboarding due to the tedious KYC procedures, whilst the company is strictly complying with the new directive. All right. Anybody think uh, they have the answer I can, for that? I can, uh, I can maybe uh, start uh, uh, saying that uh, to it, it, it really is really a correlation between how difficult is the customer boarding and the chances that the customer will end it and will uh, stay as a customer. Uh, but it's a business rather problem how actually to make it so efficient and smooth at the same time being compliant. There are many service providers, KYC service providers, trust service providers that uh, your onboarding process can be fast, smooth, Easy, but it's mostly a business decision, I would say, rather than the legal. How you could do it actually? True. I mean, it does seem like there's too many pop-ups when you come to a website nowadays. Um, that does break down the customer experience, in my opinion. So it is a business decision, but it's also a requirement by someone else that they cannot avoid and do business without. So kind of it has to be working both ways if it's to work for everybody. Uh, okay. I think if I can also add a little bit, I think, yes, it has to be a kind of a compromise between compliance and business. There is obviously a minimum requirements that the company needs to fulfill in terms of uh, due diligence, uh, but it's kind of close collaboration between the two, how to create a 
uh, smooth, effortless user experience on the outside for the consumer and also how to make all the clicks and checks internally to make sure that uh, you satisfy the regulatory needs and regulatory applications. But it's always trying to balance these things and also depends on the risk appetite of the company. True, true. <laughs> Some companies take a lot of risk. <laughs> uh, cool. So we have a couple of more. Um, what are the best forums to hire compliance specialists and AML officers in Europe? So people are already trying to hire somebody. Good advice. <laughs> would you recommend any places where you can find specialists in the area that would be able to help out? Rado? In Estonia, probably uh, for, uh, so far, uh, uh, Financial Intelligence Unit belongs to Police and uh, Border Guard Department. Uh, it would be good to have guys uh, or ladies who have uh, uh, internal affairs background, who have been studying in the same school where police people have been studying. Uh, so this is what they expect, actually, that they really are able to act as detectives. It's not in the law, but I understand, and this is what they expect from AML people. Okay. All right. Uh, then thank you, Rado, for uh, this answer. Uh, we're going to move on to the last one, and then we're going to try to select which question was the best one and announce the winner. Uh, so uh, the last question, and uh, our viewer is saying, thanks for the great webinar on crypto and regulation. Uh, so the question is for Ivars, actually, specifically. And uh, which compliance issues keeps you awake at night? Compliance issues. <laughs> that's that's an excellent question. Um, I, I think what for me what is an endless effort is to automate things in a in a balanced way. Uh, I always strive to use technology uh, within our controls within our systems, and like striking this balance between using human interactions and human resources and like automation is what is is quite challenging we have a lot of tools and solutions nowadays with machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence that are designed to identify fraud and then suspicious activity and everything but you can't always fully rely on them you have to have some human interaction who would also supervise these systems and pick out the suspicious activity out of it so for me it's a it's a constant struggle like to find the right solution and right providers to tweak them, to tailor them, to address the existing risk that we as a company have, and to what degree can we rely on these systems? So Great. I think that will be the, the main thing that is always in, in my head. <laughs> well, at least in that scenario, a human still participates in the process, so not... Yeah, so it's, it's not that bad. It's not the rise of the machines yet, so... Correct. So uh, I'll be able to go to sleep because just that, you know, <laughs> not going to be substituted. Uh, so. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's vote on uh, the best question. Do you, does anyone remember one question out of their mind that they think was the best one? Who wants to say something? Uh, for me, the best question was uh, about uh, regulation and uh, that this might result in companies leaving regulated jurisdiction and going to or some other unregulated jurisdiction. Do, do, does uh, somebody else want to vote for this question? Yeah, I'd like to support this question. That's something that I wanted to propose as okay. well. I'd like to, this one. Robert, Robert also puts his yeah. vote for the question. Yeah. All right, we have three votes uh, for the, the question about moving out of Europe because of regulations. Right, Rado, do you remember any other question that you liked? No, I actually I like the attitude of the question. So yes, I agree as well. I mean, uh, that's a unanimous decision. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the user who submitted the question, if uh, you're expecting that uh, that uh, the answer to AML5 will be exchanges moving to countries with no regulation and taxes, and uh, you're the winner of the $100 of in cryptocurrency, so I hope you get in touch, uh, and or we will get in touch with you as well, uh, to, to give you the price. And to all the speakers, uh, unless you have any closing remarks that you would like to give to our viewers at the end, 
uh, we can uh, conclude the session. Very much uh, thanks to Cryptomood, who is the host of this event. And uh, for everybody watching, check out the app uh, on uh, Play Store as, well as iTunes, or just go to the uh, website to read more about Cryptomood on Cryptomood.com. So uh, if, if there is nothing else from the speakers, then we can say that uh, we have done our job today. Very well. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the viewers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.